Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Marr. I'm with Cornell University. And uh, today I want to present on some work that we've been doing in collaboration with the University of Maine, essentially to support small scale organic vegetable farmers as they look to, towards reduced tillage practices and successful adoption of reduced tillage on their farm. So reduced tillage, we've heard a lot about at this conference. It's complemented by cover crops, crop rotations, soil amendments, and kind of this holistic soil health management plan, right? But today I wanna to talk about small farms. And generally on small farms, I'm thinking less than 10 acres, farms that are highly diversified and very tillage intensive, many crops within the growing season and many tillage events. And so these farms also, given their size, have land constraints where they can't put land into cover crop fallows for extended periods of time, right? So given these conditions, we find that amendments such as compost and reduced tillage are really driving factors in producing uh, healthy soils on these farms. So what do they look like? What can they look like on small farms? What are reduced tillage practices? Uh, how are they emerging? We're increasingly interested in permanent beds as are many small farmers. So I would define permanent beds as a system of controlled traffic, okay? So fields are divided into beds and then year after year, your tractor traffic, your foot traffic is concentrated to between bed areas, pathways, right? And then your primary and secondary tillage is generally concentrated within the bed, okay? So you're reducing compaction in the bed because of traffic. These can take many different forms depending on resources and farm size, right? The pathways are, are um, one difference. They might have sod, perennial sod in between pathways. They might manage them with mulch. They might just use periodic cultivations throughout the growing season, okay? We're really interested in these systems, permanent bed systems, as a way in which small farmers can essentially look across their farm and reduce tillage because one of the primary constraints with reduced tillage is the availability of scale appropriate equipment, right? And if you're growing 50 different crops on a farm, you're not gonna adapt a new piece of equipment for every different crop and row spacing, direct seeded transplanted crops. So instead, instead of looking at the crop, we're looking at the bed as a management unit. And then this is an entry point for these farmers to then think about reduced tillage despite their diversity. So, we're testing this through field experiment, testing these systems through field experimentation with two driving questions. One, within permanent beds, can we reduce tillage and maintain system performance? When I say system performance, I mean productivity, labor use. These are very labor intensive operations. How does reduced tillage affect labor use? Profitability, the economic side, and of course, soil health. Today, my emphasis in the uh, in the interest of time is mainly going to be around productivity with a with a taste of labor. So what does that look like on the ground? Essentially, we have a gradient of of tillage practices where we're ranging from deep tillage to no tillage. Deep tillage using a rototiller, which is very conventional for these farmers, and then essentially taking that rototiller up, to disturbing only 50% uh, of the soil volume, raising the rototiller to to four inches or 10 centimeters. And then comparing that to no tillage, where we don't use a rototiller at all for primary tillage, we take it out of the equation and we rely basically on hand tools to do the work. On top of the tillage, we've of the no-till treatment, we've also added a tarp treatment. Okay, and now tarping is a, is a increasingly uh, uh, interesting practice for these farmers. Basically they're using silage, what you might think of silage tarps, which cover your silage bunkers on dairy farms or any durable black plastic. What farms are doing is they're taking silage tarps and they're applying them to the soil surface before planting for weeks at a time. And then they're not planting within them, they're pulling them up and rotating them within the, within the field and over many seasons. So it's a very different application of plastic as we typically think about on organic farms. They're durable, they're reusable and um, they have int very interesting applications uh, to, to reduce tillage. Is what kind of function do these tarps provide and can they improve the performance of a no-till or a reduced tillage system? That's one of our driving questions. The second 
throng of our work is how do we then think about this tillage question and then and throw on organic mulches so can we use organic mulch to optimize these systems right we want to protect soil we want to regulate water use we want to suppress weeds so if you take reduced tillage practices and their interaction with organic mulches how can we create sustainable systems so in order to compare those systems we today i'll present upon two different systems no mulch and straw mulch no mulch is essentially a bare ground uh, treatment where cultivation between row and in pathways is done throughout the season uh, depending on the crop uh, we have a uh, oat and pea, cut, oat and pea um, seeded in the fall winter killed fall residue inherit that the next year that's being compared to a hand applied straw where we put mulch upon the soil surface and in the pathways about five tons per acre per year and then we're managing that uh, throughout the growing season for weed suppression and we're leaving that in place throughout the winter and inheriting to the next year reapplying over time so here we have our experimental framework. Permanent beds, uh, from our perspective, we, we would like to do this for as many years as possible. Our goal is at least four years, and we're three years into it. Today, I'm going to talk about results from the first two years. So this is, from the perspective from a farmer, this is your first four years of adoption of this practice. That's our goal. And we know that, that responses can change over time. That's the value of long-term research. We're testing two transplanted crops in rotation, cabbage and winter squash. First year cabbage, second year winter squash, return to cabbage in the, in the third year and back to winter squash. And then we're using what I'm calling adaptive pest management. Let's take the case of weeds. Are we, if, a, if one treatment is weedier than the other, are we letting the weeds take over and, and compromise the crop? No, what we're doing is we're doing hopefully what a farmer would do is try to manage those weeds given the labor resources that they have. So we're documenting the labor that goes into that process as opposed to letting weeds take over and, and compromise productivity. We're doing this at two locations, both in Freeville, New York, and in Monmouth, Maine. So in year one, both locations were growing cabbage. Year two, both locations were growing winter squash, and that's what I'm gonna present on today. So to the results, just looking at productivity, there's a couple main points that I wanna emphasize. First, location mattered, okay? In, in New York, we actually either maintained or increased productivity when we didn't have mulch in the no-till systems compared to tillage, okay? But we had a very different story when we uh, managed in mulch. Actually, there was no difference across straw mulch regardless of tillage, and we had significantly lower yields in that high residue mulch system, okay? Maine, there's relatively no differences across tillage. That, so with declining tillage, they didn't decline uh, yields, but, uh, and they didn't have as low a yields with their straw treatment, okay? Very few significant differences in Maine. So what's going on in New York? Well, we know that mulches conserve moisture, and ideally that's great in August, July and August when we have very hot times, but, but when you have extreme events, in the spring and the crops just getting established maybe all that moisture isn't such a good thing and that's exactly what we had in the first year where we had high rainfall in june those plants never got started they had wet feet to begin with and four weeks in they were the biomass from the cabbage and the no mulch system was twice as that in the straw so basically they got a slow start and they never caught up and that's that's a real risk with using high residue systems so what about winter squash? Let's take another year. Well, in New York, kind of the same story, but basically over time or over tillage, we didn't have any differences. We maintained productivity regardless of our um, um, shallow tillage, no-till or no-till tarp. There's basically no differences in tillage. And we had, again, lower yields in the mulch system, not as dramatically as they were in the first year. Um, and if, if there's anything to parse from this, it's that perhaps tillage in the mulch system uh, improved that system, looking at the deep till graph. In Maine, there's an argument there that says, hey, mulch isn't so bad. We can manage with mulch, and we can have similar productivity in a, in a, in a high residue system. 
So based on these results, I'd say there is hope, but there's definitely still risks. You, and overall in Maine, we find the same trend in that declining tillage, we maintained productivity in the second year. So this comes um, to the question again, what was going on in New York in the straw treatment? And it's another interaction that perhaps we don't really think about is the effect of straw on pests. We think of slugs um, for sure, but in this case, it was a very dry year and we have high background populations of cucumber beetles at this research farm. And despite all of our efforts to control those beetles, there was hundreds of them, hundreds of them on these leaves and they actually had a preference for that straw treatment. I can't say why that is, it's probably a combination of factors, but to me it says that not only does straw present risks from under high moisture conditions, but it potentially pre uh, presents risks in, in this interaction with, uh, with pest pressure, right? And our stands were essentially in straw mulch on average 50% of the stands in a no mulch system. So that's the productivity piece, okay? But how much labor went into all of that, all right? We, as we go back to what I was saying, we maintained productivity regardless of reduced tillage, but how much labor did we have to invest in order to maintain productivity? One index to that is the time spent hand weeding. Essentially, the no-till system required five times more hand weeding than the no mulch, right? regardless of year, straw mulch improved that. What, so it's a very labor intensive system. But what really did matter was that we was the use of tarps, right? Tarps in this case suppressed weeds primarily in the springtime They killed winter annual weeds. We inherited a weed free seat, a weed free bed for planting without any labor and we planted into it. And that's what growers are looking for. Weed free conditions, whether at planting or reduced weed populations within the growing season. So we're gonna look more at what are the benefits that tarps provide during that short window in the spring to, to, um, to replace tillage. So three take homes, reduced tillage systems can maintain productivity over these two years. Straw mulch can increase risk of yield losses and tarping can suppress weeds and improve uh, RT performance. So with that, I thank our partners. And if there's times for a question, I'd like to answer any. <laughs>